Hello, my name is David Turner and this is episode 10 of the Lunar Poetry Podcast. Today I'm joined by Lucy Reynolds and Lizzie Palmer and we're going to be discussing the life and work of Rosemary Tonks. As many of you will know, Lizzie Palmer is a poet, occasional Lunar po- Podcast host, and together we host Silence Found a Tongue, a monthly spoken word night in Waterloo in South London. Lucy Reynolds uh, runs a master's degree in artist uh, moving image at Central St Martins and is a re- relation to uh, Rosemary. Hello, both of you. Hello. Hello. Hello, Lucy. <laughs> and before we get going, um, I don't normally do lengthy introductions, but I think maybe it's important in this case as we don't, the subject of the uh, podcast isn't with us today. So I just wanted to say that there is very little about Rosemary to read on the internet, which is in a way a reason in itself for making this podcast. So I bring this up because I thought that those of you listening may be interested in the research material I used for this episode. And today I'll be uh, referring a lot to three recordings in particular. The first is The Poet Speaks from 1963, a conversation between Rosemary and Peter Orr. The second is The Disappearing Poet, a 2014 panel discussion chaired by Timothy Matthews and featuring Neil Astley. Neil is editor of Blood Axe Books and Sonar Montage, a 1966 BBC radiophonic workshop broadcast curated by Rosemary. Um, and all of these recordings are available at the British Library, and I'll put all of the reference numbers in the podcast description so people can just go out and uh, access those. They are all uh, available to the public. You don't have to request any of those. And I'll finish with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll begin uh, the discussion today with Lucy telling us a little bit about her relationship to Rosemary. Well, um, as I think I said to you earlier, my mother reminded me when I said, wasn't she my great aunt, that no, she wasn't. She was actually my mother's first cousin. Um, And um, I don't remember meeting her because I was about two. And I got a um, a little bit from a letter that she sent me talking about her remembrance of meeting me um, when I was still crawling around the floor of, of her house. But the thing that was very special, I think, for me and my brother and sister and my cousins is she decided sometime around the mid-80s that every year she would send us a letter. And this is when she had supposedly, by any, by the standards of the poetry community, completely disappeared. We all knew where she was, but she didn't want us to say. She didn't want to see us. So she was, in some sense, living as a recluse. But she would write these wonderful letters. And um, I've managed to find, I don't know, they've, you know, passed around in various suitcases and shoe boxes from art college onwards. So I've managed to find a few, which has been wonderful, and we've got them sitting here. And as you can, both Lizzie and David can see, the wonderful, quite spidery writing, very distinctive writing that she has. Um, so in a way, my relationship to her was through letters, through language, in a way. Um, And also through her reputation among the family, which of course is quite a different feeling that you're going to get of somebody, a different impression from perhaps the one that the poetry community had. My mother talks about how she remembers going up to art college, she was at St Martin's in the late 50s, early 60s, and coming up to London as a rather gauche young woman and being taken a little bit under Rosemary's wing. Rosemary would give her things like book lists of things that she should read and she would go along to Rosemary's soirees in the house that she shared with her husband Mickey um, in um, Hampstead which I think then was certainly not you know full of rock stars like it is now Um, so um, and she said that Rosemary had this just amazing spirit and just lit up the room she's incredibly witty and charming and very beautiful So, you know, she was um, a kind of the centre of attention very much. Um, So that was, it was interesting to hear that. So in a way, my notion of Rosemary was before I even really had a chance to read her poetry, because of course she tried to make sure that her poetry was was banned, really, and taken out of circulation, or rather best to say, taken out of circulation. Um, so we just got the stories of this this aunt who just um, decided to withdraw from the world completely and how she was this incredibly vibrant personality who just took herself out of out of the world um, and um, she was seen as a kind of crazy figure 
really. Um, so it's been wonderful to, you know, in a sense, I think we, she was seen as a crazy figure, but one I think that the family very much admired. I don't think she was an easy woman by any the, the sense that I get back, but there was definitely a sense that she had incredible talent. And, um, and the, yeah, that, that mm. sense existed within the family, did it? People realised. Mm. Uh, they and, did. Yeah. I mean, they saw her as quite difficult. But then it's also, you know, my family, and this is interesting because it comes through, I think, in her poetry, um, and in her prose as well, in her in her stories, um, that, um, you know, that I come, come from a family which wanted to be very correct in a very English way, and she wasn't, you know. She, but in some ways, I think she was torn at the same time, and she had a very um, unusual background in that she was her, basically her father um, died when she was very young and her mother and father and her, she was born out in, in Africa and um, when the father died, I think of, um, I can't remember, the yellow fever or, you know, it was something yes, like yeah. that, something that Black perhaps she, you, yeah, yes, you wouldn't yeah. die of now. Mm. Um, she, they came back over and the family was sort of accepting, but perhaps, you know, could have been a bit more welcoming than they were. But her, um, it was a strange situation where her sister was married to, now that, oh, it's so complicated, we wouldn't have my mother here for this, but basically two sisters married two brothers. So um, her father who died, um, she then came back to live with her sister who was married in a sense to the brother of her father. Of, um, her mother came back and was <laughs> sorry I think it's probably good if we keep this bit in yes, here because it just explains my confusion that, yeah. around it but put it this way she was born in Africa and they came back for a while and then um, uh, um, Gwendolyn which is Rosemary's mother then met someone else and went back out to Africa with Rosemary so Rosemary's stepmother stepfather and her mother went out and they spent some time there and then he died again so they came oh, back wow. Wow. so it's pretty not a great beginning but she was also sent off to boarding school as well away from you know um, when her mother was out in South Africa too so she had a pretty if you like peripatetic beginning and it's interesting that her husband Mickey also came from a South African background as well so but she obviously saw that as something which is interesting to her and I think perhaps if, you, if we look at her poetry there's a sense of looking to other horizons beyond a purely British one but also feeling stifled by the British um, context but not able somehow to escape it either. Mm. And it's, it's interesting that you say that she seemed quite difficult and was maybe regarded as a little bit crazy as well by her own family because she does I mean I really urge people to listen to the interview with Peter Orr because she mm. does, she's one of the most eccentric voices I've heard in a long time and but at the same time you know she just you mean in it, her in her accent or in what she's saying accent, but mm. just the way the way she says things mm. because it's not like that it doesn't make any sense she speaks very clearly and passionately mm. about her work mm. and the work of mm. others mm. Um, it's just she's Wonderfully eccentric. <laughs> I would love to have spoken to her, but she, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think the family didn't quite know what to make of no. her, and they were sort of in admiration, but didn't quite know how to take it further. Saying that the reason that she moved to Bournemouth in the end was because my great grandmother, who was the sister of her mother, was very kind to her, and she moved there to be near um, my aunt my great-grandmother, who we called Gar as children, um, who lived in a, a home in Bournemouth. So that's why she was in Bournemouth. Mm. Where everyone thought she was on the hippie trail, mm. somewhere who got lost, or somewhere really more glum. No, she was in Bournemouth. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe we could uh, hear one of those letters, if that's OK. Yeah, I thought what I'd do is read um, this, but well, the one that I read perhaps before that you, you heard. Yes. Um, and this was from... I won't read the whole thing necessarily, but this is from us. Oh, we've got we've got plenty of tape. We could. It's up to you. I'm going to read the whole thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, please. Yeah. So this was dated the 17th of December 1990. And as I said, she would send us one every Christmas. We would get the letter. 
and is I think worth remembering that she'd never met me, but this incredible sense of warmth and generosity that comes through. Anyway, dear Lucy, I got your letter at the end of June and was so very pleased. Thanks, and that's underlined with an exclamation mark. <laughs> Written on a train too between Paris and Geneva. How well I know those night trains out of Paris. What a fight to get a pink ticket for the first sitting for dinner. The thing is to lurk beside the dining car with a calm assurance and intercept the steward before he can run away, very swift on their feet. You must be very well organised to be able to get down to letters, though I must say it's a good time to polish off the extras, the luxuries really, which are not in the mainstream of one's life, mainstream being, and this is in brackets, career, clothes, money. Very nostalgic for me were the wagon lit cars waiting along dark platforms which I boarded every spring and autumn to go down to Italy. Nevertheless, I jump for joy that I no longer have to do it. You get tired of getting on trains and having to be well-dressed and sophisticated. A thoroughgoing nuisance. And I was always loaded down with terrible tasks such as pick up the Fiat from the factory in the Via so-and-so and and drive it through Naples onto the ferry for Ischia. The Fiat would turn out to be faulty I remember one of its merry tricks was to veer out into the oncoming traffic when you press the foot brake. How I ever got it out to Ischia, I don't know. Somehow I did. To Madagascar, Lucy, how glorious. You give me a most valuable snapshot of it. I had no idea you were such an experienced traveller. Of course, I was in West Africa at 18, drawing the local tribes people, but living safely with my stepfather and mother there. Quite a different matter. You have to arrive from the outside, self-supporting, and get under the skin of the place by your efforts. It takes grit. And she's got, she's put here in the, in the corner, she says, Lagos, where my father is buried. How interested I was to read your thoughts on the Reading Fine Art course and the people you have met. You seem to be getting the maximum out of it, both skills and people. I do believe this to be a gift of God, to have the happy knack of being interested in everything, i.e. the art of learning. A young man I knew went up to Oxford and just sulked, criticised everyone, wasted his valuable time and finally got sent down. I do remember you, aged about two, in our house in 46 Downshire Hill, Hampstead. You were put down in the middle of the room but immediately set off to explore the backs of the armchairs. Very sensible. Yes, I do so agree that we should treat the human brain with respect. Here's an interesting thing you discover. You are where your mind is. The other day I was in an old junk shop here, talking to the owner, and suddenly I looked around for Gar. Reason, the last time, say five years before, I had been with that person among those objects. She had been with me. I had just slipped back five years and was 100% back there. So the mind, spirit, is outside time, and those words are underlined. Priest discovered the same thing, but he never followed up the huge, underlined, implications. Only the body is within time and subject to eventual destruction. But the mind is a spiritual thing, a spiritual body. Since people can't see a spirit, they don't take the matter seriously. But you can see a spirit expressing itself in someone's body. There it is, activating the whole body. And you know at once what kind of spirit it is, nice or nasty. Of course, we also have non-human spirits, minds, she has in brackets, going about invisibly on the world, the evidence being those awful temples containing horrible effigies all over the east. And she's got a little star here and she's put in brackets. Um, It's beginning here with crop circles and UFOs. In no time we shall get temples of some sort and heathen worships, horrors, underlined. And then she says, I continue to think and often worry, underlined, about you. Many thoughts and much love, Rosemary. Thank you very much. Now I thought it was important to include the letters today because um, what little there, ha- there, there is to listen to on the internet or research or read about Rosemary obviously focuses solely on her poetry because that's what's available to read and there aren't many people that have a personal relationship to her but I think I think you miss a lot by only comparing Rosemary's poetry to as often done to Rambo or a Baudelaire because you miss that, her as a person and not it's very intimate, the poetry, and she's seen, I think she's often seen or spoken of as being quite a difficult and brash person, but I, I don't feel like her poetry is that. I think it's very accessible. 
the language may seem a little complicated now, but it's if you take you take time with it, it it's it's quite you know, open. And I mean, and I'm I guess I'm a lot of my work is around feminism, and of course I think can you imagine a woman at that time, very beautiful woman, <coughs> outspoken, <coughs> bright, clever. Of course, everyone was going to call her brash. Yes, mm. she's completely overstepping the mark. I mean, she never saw herself as a feminist. But then, of course, women at that time played off against each other in a way. Um, another woman must, might have found her quite um, threatening, in a sense, because she was such a strong and forceful personality. But I think that's very much... She was caught in that time, in that age. Um, perhaps if she'd been a young poet like you, Lizzie, now, she wouldn't be having to, to have gone through the things that come through in the poetry, yes, don't they? Yeah. That sense of being held back. And, you know, she talks about London particularly... Both this love, which it, it does have a Baudelairean mm. aspect to it, if you think of Paris spleen, but at the same time a kind of horror for it, how stifling and small-minded it is. Yeah. You imagine that against the those skies around in, in Africa, you know, the difference that must have been for her. And Lizzie, since you've uh, been to the British Library as well to listen to the recordings, so, um, your idea of Rosemary changed... Um, from just having read her poetry. Yeah, I mean, I've I've always felt reading her poems that I am definitely getting a sense of her character and who, who she is. Like you say, they do come across as being very intimate and true and mm -hmm. honest. So, yeah, I suppose actually hearing her voice even, that alone, you know, just has changed my... Um, my image of her, I suppose. Um, how the, how did it differ from what you thought it might sound like? I didn't realise she was so posh. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's just bringing it to life, I suppose, hearing the person and obviously speaking to you, Lucy, and getting more of an idea um, of who she was. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it, she's, she doesn't seem wildly different f from what, what I'd imagined from hearing, hearing your letters and, and what you've said about her. Um, I suppose that yeah, you had already had an insight because um, just to give context to this conversation uh, Lizzie and I met Lucy at an artist talk at the South London Gallery in Camberwell where she read um, the letter that she read just now on, on, for us um, so we have already had a chance to talk to Lucy and find out a, a few personal details about Yeah that. it was a really nice coincidence wasn't it that um, I'd been invited by this wonderful young artist Dorian Van Mel who's whose own writing is it's wonderful, yeah. um, to be in conversation with her. And we said what we would do is bring pieces of writing and share them with each other rather than it being an, in conversation, which I seem to have to, to do a lot of. <laughs> and yes, and it's wonderful when um, you two came up to me afterwards and that she happened to be a favourite poet of yours. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I felt I wanted to bring something personal to the conversation but also in a way to honour Rosemary. Um, so so that was wonderful. And I keep meeting young artists and poets who are, are so... It's so exciting, only for me, but for the rest of my family too, mm. to feel... And again, I was talking to my mother about this, and she said, you know, Rosemary wasn't the, you know, the most... She felt Rosemary was waiting for younger generations perhaps than her. That she was. This is why her, Rosemary's letters to me were so warm. But the feeling we had that Rosemary would be incredibly excited by the inspiration. She she wouldn't be happy at all. We all know that about her poetry being put out there again. Mm. But it has to be. But I think the one thing she would be happy about is the inspiration it is providing Lizzie for you and other poets. Yeah. Definitely. Actually, yeah, I wanted to move on next to talk about Rosemary's life and publishing history. But maybe we can start with, I, I really love the quote. I mean, she's talking to Peter Orr in the recording, um, in the interview. And she talks about um, the poets of her generation. Um, she had, felt like she had no connection to them because they lacked passion and they lacked the ability to realise the passion of real life and there's a quote you can have a tiff with your wife and that's enough to write about you know and like, she didn't feel like people were, were real, writing about the, the important matters um, and she did seem to have a lot of faith in the future generations that they would come back to that uh, actually just one small point about the the letters um, Neil Astley in the uh, Dispiring Poet panel discussion mentioned that 
it's very important to remember that when Rosemary took herself off to Bournemouth that she stopped writing poetry but she did not stop writing no. you know she really threw herself into writing letters and mm. keeping diaries and stuff so mm -hmm. there was do, and do you feel that by uh, it was just as you were reading mm. I, I decided mm. that maybe by stopping writing uh, giving up poetry in a sense she was able to communicate freely again in another way and that's why she was able to come back to writing letters um I wonder yeah. I don't know um I think uh, maybe this is an overly romantic thing to say but then she was into Baudelaire and Rombo so I think <laughs> I'm allowed to say that you know but I'm sort of looking to you Lizzie here um that um I don't think if you're a writer you can stop yourself Maybe you close down one particular channel, but you open up another. I mean, one thing we haven't... Well, we'll talk about why she disappeared mm -hmm. later. But I do have, if you would just yeah. bear with me, I have something here that she's talking about her... She's talking about her writing. Um, when she's saying... She's mostly saying she's not doing the same kind of writing, but she's doing academic writing instead. So maybe that kind of answers your question. So you can probably hear on the podcast here. I mean, this is sound effects. Of, <laughs> of, uh, um, but yeah, maybe it's this one. Oh yeah, no, I don't write. This is from '87. Uh, so this is the first, the earliest letter I've got of hers, of the ones that I've kept. No, I don't write any poetry now. And she says, I was building up my academic reputation when my eye op came along. And we can talk about this, I guess. This meant articles for the Times or the Observer. I remember I actually did a translation of a poem by Botticelli for them. Amazing waste of time. <laughs> or the New York Review of Books. It was prestige work for tuppence. But I found that, and she's underlined this, mental training very useful. Now that I study the Bible... The past, this past discipline has been, and this is underlined, enormous advantage. Exactly the preparation needed because your mind is alerted to the to unraveling uh, story, mysteries hidden in words. So I don't know if that answers a little bit mm -hmm. what you mean, but she she hadn't stopped writing or reading. I mean, and I I don't know what she was. I can't remember in the Peter Orr interview if she talks about what she was reading other than. Baudelaire or Rombo, as you write, they always no. get, they're always the names that get brought yeah. up. There must have been others. Um, I, don't know. I, don't, I don't remember offhand, mm. no. Uh, so, maybe we could, yeah, we'll talk about, a bit about her publishing. Um, so she was published quite young, wasn't she? With, she published short stories. Yeah, first, children's it? stories. Children's stories, yeah. she, about, uh, about 17, 18, she was already writing and getting short stories for children published, but actually, interestingly, thinking the same montage, she was, they're actually selling them to the BBC to mm. be on Children's Hour. So she was quite interesting that she always had a sense of an audience for children there. Um, and um, I think the poetry just came from them. I mean, she didn't have a university education at all. She had, and of course, boarding schools then would have just been about training them to, to breed nicely, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. wouldn't think there would have been any decent education there. Um, but um, so she was pretty self-taught um, and I think it just all emerged around the same time but I really yeah that I, I couldn't really answer no, no, so I don't really sort of yeah have the have the details of that but but Neil's books pretty good mm -hmm. um, there's a short autobiography in the book a, a biography rather which um puts all that in the right kind of order, mm -hmm. I think. But yeah, he I did think a huge amount of work, didn't he? He was collating all that. Oh, he was amazing yeah. what he's done. I mean, just all... He's, for years, he's he's just um, wanted to... You know, when she was alive, he was talking to my family, to my Aunt Jill and my mother about, you know, can we at least tempt her out? And Yeah. <laughs> But she wasn't having it, so... But <laughs> We keep referring back to other recordings, but in, in the panel discussion... There's a he, he says that going having seen her diaries after mm. her death, mm. that he managed to find a date which matched up when he'd sent her a second postcard, letting her know that the Radio Four Lost Voices program mm. had been out about mm. Rosemary's disappearance mm. Mm. while she was still alive, mm. um, and it was she, I think she simply referred to it as the second postcard from Satan. Or <laughs> <laughs> she really, well, well, I mean, she, we uh, can she would have just seen it as you know, some sort of temptation to come back into publishing. Exactly. 
I mean, I think she was absolutely... Well, I guess we'll talk about this and talk about her yeah. disappearance. Um, but after... Um, well, but Lizzie's going to read one, read a response to her poem. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to hearing your poetry. That's what would excite her. That's... Yeah, that, yeah that, I mean, that's... Um, what... Yeah, actually, a question to Lizzie. What is it about her work mm. that drew you to want to write a response? Um, I think just because it's so passionate and, you know, as, as we've heard her say in, in recordings and interviews, she, you know, about why isn't everybody writing about the grand passions anymore and things like that. And I think I agree a lot in a lot of ways with what she says. And um, I mean, I have a quotation, actually, which is in the front of her first collection of poems where she says, I want to show human passions at work and to give eternal forces their contemporary dimension in this landscape. Um, I don't know, I think I just, I find that appealing, mm. I suppose. But it's that's so interesting, Lizzie, because that, the letter that I read, she's talking about internal forces mm. there, isn't she? So that sense, something that never left her. Yeah, it seems to come across quite strongly in, in everything, really. Mm. Um, I mean, I... I mean, I, you know, I admitted to Lucy when we first met, I was unaware of Rosemary's work. Um, it was more her life story that I'd heard a, a bit about. It sort of re reflected a lot of things, mirrored a lot of things in my life. But having read a lot of Rosemary's stuff now, I'm not at all surprised that Lizzie is such... <laughs> um, that um, Rosemary's way of thinking about poetry appeals. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about Rosemary's... Um, she talks a lot about feeling alone. Mm. I just wondered how that weighs up against her need to communicate with people and wanting to feel connected to people. How that, I don't... Because it's not an uncommon thing with poets, is yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, I've, it's interesting, actually, you've said already about her being torn between things, and it is something that's come up a few times for me in different ways. Um, you know, some sort of antagonism, and particularly it seems like being the passionate poet character and how I think a lot of us would describe it as sort of being like an affliction in a way uh, but also quite enjoying it I saw I don't know if I'm just reading into it but I kind of get that impression from her that there's a but there must that. be I imagine and, and tell me what you think because I'm I've said this to you before I write um, but I write as an academic because I'd be too I'd be too scared to go into that arena of creative writing in any sense it's I have a structure into which I can write, you know, I have to footnote, I have to, you know, there's various things, so that keeps me safe and sane in a way, but I think it's, um, and I can't find the letter I got from Rosie Wood, it really stayed with me and I really hope I will find it, about the eye, she talks about the isolation, but also the one thing I know just a little bit, and I imagine that Lizzie, you must really experience this. When it's going well, it's the most fantastic drug. Yeah. It's hallucinatory, it's vivid. The sense of how you're able to access corners of your mind in particular ways and what comes forth, I can see how it could be um, um, very... Well, maybe that's why hey, um, Rosemary talks about Satan, in the sense that there is um, something so... Um, compelling mm. about it isn't there yeah no I certainly feel that way myself I mm. mean you know it's, it's a very solitary thing to do and you know I think yeah there is I don't know I suppose it's going back to you know why you do it in the first place but wanting to express yourself and how you feel but then taking yourself off into a, a little room by yourself to write write it down <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe show it to people maybe not I don't know. It's it is a bit of a a bit of a strange. Um, what's the word? Contrast, I suppose, which is something I think about a lot anyway. But I, like I say, I do get the impression from the way her character comes across that perhaps she had a bit of a, you know, was maybe torn between those things. And like you say, being when she was writing poetry and was quite well known, she you know it was holding soirees and was clearly very sociable and you know the life and soul of the party it seems but then also obviously then she gave it all up and mm. I don't know um, it's an interesting well, just while we're talking about the reasons that you felt 
like you wanted to write a response to her. Maybe we could take the first couple of poems and then it'd be a good time, good time for you to read. So, so we'll begin with Lucy. So I'm going to read um, a poem of hers, which I particularly love. It's quite a well-known one, I guess. Um, Orpheus in Soho. His search is desperate, and the little night shops of the underworld with their kiosks, they know it. The little bars as full of dust as a stale cake. None of these places would exist without Orpheus, and how well they know it. When the word goes ahead to the next city, an underworld is hastily constructed with bitch clubs, with cellars and passages, so that he can go on searching, desperately. As the brim of the world is lit, and breath pours softly over the earth, as heaven moves ahead to the next city with deep airs and with lights and rains, he plunges into Hades for his search is desperate. And there is so little risk down there. That is the benefit of searching frenziedly among the dust shops and blind alleys. There is so little risk of finding her in Europe's old blue Caspar, and he knows it. Thank you very much. And Lizzie? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I wrote this more as a response to the overall feeling and atmosphere that I picked up reading her poetry um, and and the idea of her character that comes across through the poems. Uh, it doesn't have a title. <clears throat> I realise as I pace the fluctuating walkways of London dusk and dawn, as I pass from bedroom to cafe, dark desolate bed to deserted cafe, along side streets of discreet grandeur, through dust and mud in the dinge of hungover alleys. The Bedouin she has walked them before. In dressing gown, cigarette smoke evaporating into the dim chill, amid dissolving illusions of day or night. The clear airy vessel of the city, and the furtive entanglement, and the oscillations of everything that never changes. She dreamt it all already, I must not forget. The lure of a dark corner, and the chance of escape from a choking decay, in my condition on emerging, grubby and dog-eared, or freshly broken open, I am ready for rinsing, whether by coffee or alcohol, or by the atmosphere alone. But the Bedouin, she walked here first, and she is still here to be felt. Gown, a holy robe, cigarette smoke, incense cleansing the new dawn air with the fog of memory, a reminder. Do not forget her, though she may have wished you to. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> what a pleasure to hear that. Um, yeah, so listening to um, Rosemary speak about her own work, it seemed that the, uh, the audience was very important to her, which might seem like a silly thing to say, but it's not always very important to a lot of poets. And... I was wondering, because I, I didn't realise it uh, until you mentioned it earlier, Lucy, that she'd written children's stories for radio. And so it's very possible that her interest in how her audience would receive her words could have come from those early experiences, especially if she was drawn to reading, uh, sorry, writing children's books anyway. Um, so just wondering from uh, both of you, really, if you, what sort of sense do you get from Rosemary um, with her view towards her audience? Well, I guess the, if I can, I take that question in a slightly different direction, yes, David, and just ask because I was curious. You said most, some poets aren't interested mm. in audience. I mean, Lizzie, do you find that? Um, yeah, it's a debate that comes up mm. a lot between all of us. <laughs> yeah, I'm really um, curious. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, different poets certainly have different relationships with the audience. Um, I mean. Obviously, some put more emphasis on the performance side and, you know, perhaps rely a bit on audience reaction. Um, I mean, it's without getting into the page stage. Well, we can't get into that. Comes up, well, we could get into that in, yeah. in a moment because she. Stage? So, you know, page writing stage. for the page or. Gosh, that's interesting to me, mm. yeah. It, it's, well, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think both Lizzie and I would assume that that's quite. A contemporary debate mm. as whether the, there is a 
divide between the stage and the page, but it actually comes up in uh, Pete, it's a question from Peter Raw yeah. mm. to Rosemary Thomas well, about. Well, if you think about uh, the period and she's writing, you know, this mm. is the period of the Beats. Yes, and you incarnation, know. and yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, what's so interesting, I think, is that she's slightly held apart and not interested. It seems that she's got a problem with some of the rather stiffer poets of the time. But when I read that, I'm like, well, you know, what about Holy Communion? What about um, what was going on at the Royal Albert Hall? I mean, that wasn't stiff. Mm. Um, that was, pay- well, I mean, you, I don't know if you've seen the film by Peter Whitehead. Yes, we yeah, watched we it the other night. It. Yeah, it, I mean, that <laughs> it's tells madness. it all. It's yeah, complete yeah. madness. <laughs> I think there was a fair amount of substances involved yes, yes. there, was there not? <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, I just think there was that whole um, burgeoning of, of that and mm. I kind of wondered why she maybe she was just a generation a little bit too old do you think that Rosemary might have just rejected the need to have to have some sort of substance in order to feel those passions you know because I think there, there could have been easily been a, a big divide between those who felt that it was enough to merely live life to, mm. to feel mm. those ways and then there was a new generation coming that were talking about you know, taking certain substances in order to heighten these experiences, mm. you know. And that looks like it could be quite a clear conflict, although it's quite prevalent now in society. And I, don't, I can't really put myself into the position of knowing what it was like before that happened. Uh, That's funny, isn't it? I mean, I think there is a generational thing. I think she was an older generation. And um, I get the feeling from what I have read around, and again, it would be interesting to know what Neil would think around this, um, that she didn't have a lot of truck with that scene. But at the same time, the reason I got interested in Sony Montage was an old cutting of my mum's where she's standing next to Alexander Trocchi, you know, famous poet heroin addict. <laughs> so um, the fact she was doing stuff with him says that there were connections. There. But I was very interested to hear her answer to Peter Orr where she said that poetry should... Um, try as far as possible uh, as much as possible to work in the ear and on and in the eye and she said that almost the perfect poem would work in both ways it's just so difficult to get them to mm, yeah. you maybe have to settle for one or the other mm. so she seemed quite open-minded mm, that mm. It, p- poetry could be purely for performance as mm. well um, but you should be uh, your ultimate goal should be something that works in both forms yeah. mm. Which is quite. quite I mean, do you, would you agree with that, Lizzie? The idea of page and stage. That I, I don't know. That I mean, I'm not a poet. I just know that when I read Gertrude Stein, he's one of my favourites. You have to speak it. Yeah. No. Certainly, more recently, since I've been performing my poems, I think that is quite important. I would agree with her on that. And I mean, I write poetry, which is it's definitely more for the page. If you want to put it into either bracket but um obviously I, I love to perform it as well and I think if it can work in both ways then definitely and I think it's a shame for poetry not to be read aloud anyway. but I guess it does place a certain vulnerability on I, I imagine if it's poems you write something with real intimacy mm. then you're sharing a different kind of intimacy with a book aren't you yeah. people open that page and you feel you're speaking to them in that quiet meditative space in their own time mm. but I guess if you're up there on a stage with people looking up at you to put your emotional world out there yeah you see again I'm in such awe <laughs> because I only talk about other people in fact so in a lot of time kind of feels like I'm footnoting people's drug use from the counterculture rather than actually you know I think to put yourself out there must be tough and I think for Rosemary I'm sure she would have put this front on wouldn't she of um, the sparkling hostess front but I shouldn't think there was a sparkling hostess underneath mm. much yeah and there's also um, quite a subtle difference between um, you know saying that you don't write for an audience is not the same as rejecting an audience so you know the, the difference mm. could be that you write purely for yourself and hope that people like it that's still writing for yourself and not for an audience whereas yeah. it seems that I, I personally think that Rosemary is writing for her audience. I don't think she's writing just for herself, you know. Mm. I think it's... Yeah, well, she talks, I think it was in the Peter interview as well um, about what, what a lovely thing it is to have to write something well enough that it makes someone else respond. I think mm. 
she did place importance on that as well. Well, she's done good then. <laughs> you've, you've done this wonderful response here. It's fabulous. Thank you. And since we've mentioned it a couple of times and we were talking about the sound of poetry and how it works, we're going to move on and talk a bit about this uh, BBC Radiophonic Workshop programme called Sona Montage, which was recorded in 1966. So the Radiophonic uh, Workshop was a BBC department which was uh, tasked with developing sound effects and uh, theme tunes and most famously uh, came up with the Doctor, Doctor Who theme tunes. So that would give people an idea of <laughs> 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 what kind of thing they were up to There's lots of um, uh, wah pedals and loop machines um, but it was incredibly experimental yeah in its time. really experimental yeah. and um, it's well worth just trying to find photographs of the studio because it looks amazing because the equipment was also massive and mm. there were just <laughs> banks and banks of tape reels and yeah um, so in order to introduce this program um, or what would this, this particular subject um, and in lieu of having at the moment permission to play any clips from the BBC uh, programme itself I'm going to paraphrase um, Rosemary's introduction to the programme Sono Montage is an experiment to combine poetry with electronic sound it, its aim is to put a dramatic edge on poetry read aloud and that edge is sound what you hear in the recordings are sound collages or sound illuminations in the case of these sound collages, the poem is the dominant partner and is all important. In the past, whenever music has been combined with poetry, I've had the feeling that two strong art forms were fighting for my attention and that they were mutually exclusive with a tendency to listen to the poetry on the music's terms. And so, as a poet, I wanted to find a partnership which was much more equal or one with the favourable balance on the side of poetry. And I'm going to begin with... Uh, talking to Lizzie because I've, I just think it's amazing that that's particularly the second paragraph there um, a, a lot of people, poets that I know in London now are having that discussion still mm. about the idea of collaboration between musicians and poets and um, uh, yeah um, I mean it's something I've recently become interested in and perhaps you know doing something of my own along those lines but yeah I recently performed at a night where I had musical accompaniment and I've never done that before it was it was a bit weird <laughs> to read with that but um, I think yeah she, she was very ahead of her time in doing that kind of an experiment and obviously yeah putting the importance on the poetry over the music which is you know un unusual now you know if you go to sort of mixed nights of poetry and music it's usually the music that has you know, more more audience members coming to hear it. Mm. <laughs> and especially with the ease interest. of um, putting music to poetry mm. now, with, you know, you, the, the, probably what would have been a whole studio in the BBC in the 1960s, you've got the ability to replicate all of those sounds on a mobile phone now. Yeah. You know, so a lot of people are attempting, aren't they, mm. to put music. Um, but it's not always working, is it? No. <laughs> 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 no. Um, and, uh, you know, regardless of whether the... Sono Montage project worked or not it was a very interesting project to get going and um, mm. publicly funded in that way um, I should say just on Sono Montage mm. that it wasn't something she took it to the BBC yes. but before that it had already been performed which I think was when Alexander Trocchi was involved which was the year before at the Hampstead Poetry yes. Festival so it was definitely a live one off live thing first mm. okay yeah, because if you try to um, find it on the internet, actually, there are, you, there are a lot of different sources because it's not originally a BBC mm. production, so it's not, not always linked back to mm. the reference number with the BBC, so it can be quite tricky to find sometimes, yeah. I don't think there's much out there, is there? Is there much on it? Um, there are. There's a, an amazing page called Wikidelia, which is um, <laughs> a wiki page uh, site just for Delia Derbyshire. Who oh, was the head course, engineer, so, sound engineer yeah, at, at the, the, big, at the well, radio funding yeah. workshop? So yeah. anything that ultimately went through there, but there's a, a tiny, tiny compared to other programs, a really tiny paragraph about the Rosemary Tonks mm. uh, program because there's so little about it. It's not um, how it came about. Yeah. Well, I should say um, there's this great young researcher, Thea Smith, who's an artist and um, a performer who's doing her MA at the moment when she's making Sony Montage, quite an important part of that in relation to the Radiophonic Workshop. 
Um, she also is the publisher, one of the publishers of Salt. I don't know if you've come across Salt. It's a feminist mm. art magazine. So she's doing really great work on that and just mm. gathering all the sources. I'm hoping that she'll be able to publish that somewhere at some stage. Mm. Um, but what were your thoughts on the radio programme in itself, uh, Lizzie? Um, I thought it was great. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a shame that more after that was done, more sort of similar things didn't come about. Um, it, it's strange, but I, I suppose that um, rec- uh, reflects the whole of the counterculture, doesn't it? You know, yeah. as as this son- sonar montage went out in the same year or the year before you'd had Incarnation at Royal Albert Hall where 7,000 people turned up to watch poets and proper poets read, you know, and it seemed like a birth of something, but then it all sort of fizzled out yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it didn't really go anywhere. I mean, the Bob Cobbing also, um, he did something the same year. Now, again, Thea writes more about this, but I think there were three different programmes which were commissioned, including Sony Montage, and the one with Bob Cobbing as well, you know, the concrete poet, mm. who was such a key part of the counterculture. I can't remember what the other one was. So it's almost like they decided to do a finite pro- number of programmes, and then, they, as you're right, they just never mm. continued beyond that, really. But then again, maybe Rosemary wasn't pushing to be involved any further. No. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, actually, maybe now would be a good time to have another poem. Um, Lizzie's going to read a poem called Badly Chosen Lover, which uh, appears on the uh, Sonoma Montage programme. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this was the first poem of Rosemary's that I ever came across, and it's my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I would urge anyone, if they get the chance, to go to the British Library and listen to her reading. Um, obviously, listen to Sonoma Montage and listen to her reading her own poems. Um, as normal as well. Uh, she had a really beautiful reading voice for mm, her poetry. Did, I don't think I'll do it justice, but <laughs> here we go. It's Badly Chosen Lover. Criminal, you took a great piece of my life and you took it under false pretenses. That piece of time, in the clear muscles of my brain, I have the lens and jug of it. Books, thoughts, meals, days and houses, half Europe, spent like a coarse banknote. You took it, leaving mud and cabbage stumps. And, criminal, I damn you for it, very softly. My spirit broke her fast on you, and, Turk, you fed her with the breath of your neck. In my brain's clear retina, I have the stolen love behaviour. Your heart, greedy and tepid, brothel meat, gulped it, like a flunky with erotica. And, very softly, criminal, I damn you for it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we might move on from talking about Sonoma Montage now, apart from to say to anybody that's um, interested in um, putting poetry not to music, because that is not what the, the point of the project was, but anyone that's looking to collaborate with writers and musicians, you should definitely check that out. Um, it's, it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now, uh, well, inevitably, with Rosemary, we're going to talk about... When, she took herself off to Bournemouth. I don't, I don't want to. I, I feel like it's um, untrue now to say disappearance because it wasn't really. It was only disappearance in certain people's eyes, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, she. Um, um, she had. You might have heard in the letter I mentioned an eye op. She had mm. terrible problems with her eyes, and she had this this ver- this uh, eye operation that was rendered her blind for or she had an operation afterwards. I think, can't remember exactly why. Again, this is all in Neil's book, the, the real details of it. But she felt very, you know, talking earlier, Lizzie, about her feeling alone. I think she felt very alone in this sense. And she and her husband, I don't know if they were still together at that stage. And it should, it should be said that, I don't know if it's, I'm going to bring a biographical element to the poems, but I think they were, you know, I don't think they were particularly... He was away for long stretches of time because he still worked back in Africa. So I think they're both, they both took lovers, um, even though they stayed together for a long time. But she, <clears throat> he then left her, and I think this is around the time that she had this um, 
she had this blindness for a while. She was really, really in, at a very low ebb physically, really at a low ebb. And also she's always searching for something. Maybe it goes back to that idea of an internal spirit or something, but her mother also died and, um, you know, died died in, in the bath very unexpectedly. Mm. Um, so, and I think, you know, she'd had a very close, but, you know, not easy relationship with her mother. So that happened around the same time. I guess it's that thing, isn't it? It's a circumstantial, various things came together at a certain point. The other thing was that she had been looking into religion a lot, but she'd been looking a lot into Eastern religion and um, and then found that, that uh, she could get no solace from that. And again, I think you picked that up in one of the letters that I read. And this is why she turned to back to Christianity, to Judo, um, Christ, uh, you know, Christianity, rather than she was looking a lot at Sufi um, and Buddhism, things like that before mm. then. And then she got very angry and felt that they weren't helping her in any way. And she was in very feeling very low, as I said. And that's when she turned to Christianity. And I think it was must have been around that time that she left London. Um, and I think the reason she went to Bournemouth, and again, Neil writes about this, and my mother would be the one to talk about this because she knows the details much better and remembers it. Um, that's where Gar had always been kind to her. You know, you he'd pick it up from that letter that I read about seeing Gar's spirit or whatever. So she went down to see her and ended up just staying. It became a bit of a, a safe haven in a, a storm, and she was physically very, very low, mm. as well as, you know, feeling battered by life in many directions. Um, and then, you know, I guess it's that thing that perhaps comes back to that idea of Satan and being tempted and you know, everything you talk about, the, the difficulty of being a poet in terms of those two sides, um, the, the ecstasy of it, and yet at the same time, just those, those levels of intensity, I think, for her, she just felt it was too dangerous mm -hmm. in a kind of way. Um, she, from what I've read and heard about her, it definitely seems as though she had quite... Um, an extreme personality and in that, in that I mean things seem in her life to be black or white and there didn't seem to be much middle ground for her and I think people um, I've had the experience in myself in, um, with my own personality if you're if you have that if you know if, if only polar opposites ex exist in your life it leads to a lot of rejections or anything that exists in the middle ground you know you, often you don't reject the polar opposite things those two things are fine you can understand those perfectly well anything that lays on the middle ground which mm. maybe comes back to why she rejected so many poets contemporary poets in the 60s because she couldn't identify with how they could see find any interest in the, uh, the realities of life you know um, uh, and then I suppose it makes sense that if you have that kind of personality that it would exacerbate any emotional crisis that you have and would lead to you know also I think that kind of personality leads to people searching a lot in their life mm. you know and trying to fill mm. gaps you know for whatever reason that, that may have come about there's a lot of speculation as to um, where these gaps may have opened up in Rosemary's childhood you know with mm. uh, losing her parents mm. and mm. and uh, mm. and been, there been a lot of turmoil but that's speculation that's, I don't think that's really important the important thing is how she then came to try and deal with uh, that, that feeling in her life, that sort of searching. Mm. And I think you're right in the sense that her reaction was an extreme one. Mm. Um, cut it out. But perhaps she felt that was the only way she could survive. Mm. And if one can imagine being blind and alone, not just alone writing your poetry in a room, but, you know, blind and feeling, you know, it, it must have been very, very frightening in many ways. Yeah. And I get the feeling she was frightened and um, she's frightened by the idea of you know she talked in that letter I I read out talks about nice and nasty spirits I mean I do think she um, was very um, sensitive to atmospheres mm. and, and um, perhaps this felt like a place that she could be safe you know um, 
And I've got a little bit I could read here, yeah, which yes, I think please, yeah. might address, which was from a letter that I received from her in... Oh, I'm guessing I'm all muddled up now. Um, I think it was 91. Anyway. Um, yes, let's get them muddled up. Uh, oh, yes, it starts at the... I've got the top of page two here. See the great dangers in trying to take on more primitive black magic cultures and imagine you can get away unharmed yourself. Um, the Hindu religion is death, of course. So she really... F those carved figures represent demons, and if we Westerners think demons don't exist, any Hindu priest, or for that matter Buddhist, will quickly disillusion you. They do all those peculiar things, dash, and rituals, meditation, chanting, and all that, to ward off evil spirits, and nobody gets up to all those ridiculous antics without good reason. Um, so, and then she says here, look what happened to John Lennon. <laughs> that. Um, but uh, anyway, at the bottom she says, I'm most sorry there was a poem of mine in any anthology at all. I withdrew all my poems which had been solicited for anthologies then to be published. And then she puts in brackets John Wayne's The Listener Anthology published by Derwent May, etc. So the book you have is doing something illegal and I could sue them for it. I dimly remember writing to some women publishing group because the Basically, I found one of her poems published in an uh, anthology of women poets. And so I, read, I sent this letter going, I found one of your poems, and this was the response. Um, I think she's put in brackets here, I think someone called Joy M Melio, and said no, with a capital N, to their request. I also said no, also with a capital N, to a woman who had written an entire novel around one of my poems. It was brutal, but I had to be consistent. I said no, capital N, to an Arts Council grant, to a film company that wanted to give me a stipend until I produced, inverted commas. Um, I also said no to my American and my English publishers, and then, as I was afraid I would be pursued for my latest manuscript, 100,000 words, first half of a novel the size of War and Peace, six years' work, this is in, this is in inverted commas, I burnt it in the incinerator here in the garden. Well, you don't do all that without excellent reasons, exclamation mark. Never mind the fame, I was burning many thousands of pounds. I burnt it together with all the copies and notes. I can tell you, I meant business. That's it, that's what she says about that. And then she says, it was so nice of you to ask about my year. <laughs> um, I've learned some absolutely thrilling things. Um, uh, well, she's put in the brackets here, Bet's that bit about saying, no, she said, I didn't like what I had written and thought it was harmful. Mm. So you can see how categorical that mm. was. She really meant it. She did. It was, al it was almost as if, like, the writer in her had to die completely, mm. wasn't it? Mm. She, couldn't, she couldn't exist in a dual role. She had to be this new uh, version of herself. Mm. Those you, though, I guess we, as we said before, the look at all these. This yes, yeah. the writer hadn't yeah, yeah. done. No, no, absolutely. But she was. She couldn't be that writer, that writer anymore, yeah. could she? Yeah. Um, and you can see from the beginning of that letter um, that she felt, in some sense, spooked. Without wishing to make that say that in a trivial way, mm. um, that she felt. That's why to turn to Christianity was felt like a safe place for her. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the media's reaction. To, and when I say media, because she's a poet, that's mainly other poets and editors. And as to why they were so shocked and why it was such an intrigue. And I've been talking to poets and writers recently about how they viewed their own... Um, if if they go for any turmoil at any point with their own creativity, how how they view it, and a lot of people talk about their creative path being a straight train track, you know, and what's behind them is terrible and has been proven to be terrible, but it's done, and they're hopefully moving away from it, and what lays ahead is almost certainly terrible, so it's not always a very pleasant experience, but this like a, a sort of the analogy I was using, this, the spur that leads you to destroy all of your work. That, that sort of offshoot from the track most people couldn't understand taking that route no matter how much they were sure they hated what came before and what would 
certainly come ahead of them. Most people could not put themselves in the position. So do you think that's why the media, and I'm thinking especially Radio 4's Lost Voices programme, why there was so much intrigue around it? Because people just can't understand why somebody that talented would reject completely because it doesn't seem a natural conclusion of the creative mind to then destroy everything. David, I'm not sure I'd look at it like that because I think there's a long history of artists destroying their work. I mean, Michael Landy's the famous one, mm. um, but, you know, artists um, burning their paintings yeah. or... Um, but I, I think what I reckon, speaking as someone who's a researcher and passionately tries to bring to attention women artists that I feel have been overlooked, there's something in us that cannot resist a mystery. Mm. What happened to her? And um, I think, I, I wonder, and this is extrapolation on my part, mm. that at the time when she disappeared, people were, a le were less interested than in the last maybe 10 years when they get a, a whiff of this interesting poet, female poet, and what happened? They want to know, they want to bring, bring, bring as we all do, they want to piece together what happened to her. And Neil has done an amazing, Neil Nazi's done an amazing job on this part, but I don't know about the, um, I, I don't know if, I think it's about rediscovering her, and I think it's, I guess I'm, sorry, I'm not putting this very well, but I think as a researcher I understand that detective impulse mm. to try and find somebody. You know, that you might have come across one of her poems after no one go, this is an amazing piece of writing. How can I find out more about this person? And then to find out that she decided to stop and withdraw is only going to make it mm. that much more fascinating, isn't it, to find out more? I under, definitely understand the mystery side mm. of it, but there's also um, part of the human condition that will deliberately... Put, I, I'm just trying to word this properly. The, the way that people, if they hear oh, Rosemary or anyone destroyed mm. their work, mm. and people say, mm. oh, that's a terrible shame. Why mm. did they do that? Often it isn't considered a shame because future generations can't see the artwork mm. it's considered a shame for other reasons you know as if somebody is rejecting their gift and then i'm just, just wondering about the the element of guilt that may have been laid on to rosemary she may not have been aware of it if she took she herself away enough absolutely you know. took herself yeah. out of it i mean the only people she was really in contact with i think well we can't know her relationship mm. to neighbors and so on around her was but was her family yeah um, and even then, you know, by letter, there's yeah. no way she, you can imagine she remained a mysterious presence because we would get these letters and she diligently wrote them to my sister, my brother, my cousin Matthew and his two sisters um, every year. So that was quite a lot of writing to do mm. um, in response perhaps to letters that, and you can hear from her writing how generous and involved it is. So she was um, prepared to go that far but there's no way we would ever have met her. So what am I saying in response to you? I guess what I'm saying is um, she, she, well, I guess what we were saying before, that she felt uh, she had to cut that part of herself away. It was a cauterized herself. I mean, it's difficult to answer in terms of the, yeah. it, for, on Rosemary's behalf, because yeah. what I was actually asking was more of a generalized yeah, point sure. about creatives yeah. and how they can reject their work. I mean, I personally, can, I completely understand how it can happen, but, do you but think I'm just—it's—it's—I'm just always amazed that more people don't see it as well. Do you think then, David, and Lizzie as well, that it's something other writers and creative people can understand? It's more the people outside of that world who who are perplexed by it. No, I've, that's what surprised me. I think I've found a lot of writers that are surprised. I mean, how yeah. do you about yeah. the the, the destruction of the work not so much um taking yourself away because i think that's easier to mm. understand um i mean i certainly wanted to do that to everything i've ever written before you know yesterday or even <laughs> <laughs> just the other day i was thinking shall i just burn everything else and start again but you know haven't actually done it so i don't know really what makes you want to do that just, is that that's not too personal to us i don't know i just 
thinking it's terrible, I suppose, and mm. thinking, oh, is, is that mm. what I want my legacy to but be? But do you feel no. trapped by it? A little bit. Mm. But then I always think, oh, there's something else to be written, and then I don't really worry too much about it. I'd rather get on with writing something better or trying to. Yeah, you see, this is where I'm, you know, you're much more courageous than I am. I, I, I stepped, I stepped, what, took a sideways step, write about other people, and then you don't, you can always say, well, I mean, even if it's a terrible piece of writing, at least perhaps it's giving more scholarship to <laughs> blah, 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 you know what I mean? But I, I'm, I'm married to a, a very fine painter, and, um, you know, I know he lives through that the whole time, and he has to be doing it. He says it's almost like if he's in the process mm. of painting, then he's able to do it. It's when he stops and looks and looks back that it must be like a sense of vertigo in some strange way. Yeah, I think so. I and mean, I think it was a, was it Bukowski? I can't remember. He said um, he never feels as good as while writing, but beforehand, leading up to it, he feels terrible. And afterwards, he feels all horrible about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the best thing ever is while you're in you're in the zone and doing it um but yeah I, t- I definitely understand feeling a bit suffocated by it and wanting to just yeah get rid well, that, that, and that's sort of what I was I got a sense from just from reading and talking to you Lucy was that and this is obviously just from my own head there's no basis in facts only but it Rosemary seemed to be trapped or stifled by mm. it the poet, Rosemary mm. Tonks, the poet, mm. and needed to escape from that. Mm. And the maybe the uh, religious feelings and the feelings about um, family were just, they're just a consequence of, uh, a lot of, I've found a lot of uh, creatives are running away or towards something and often it's the same thing. <laughs> Quite often it's just a, a loop, you know, and they're trying to fill some sort of they're searching for something you know and quite often the the art in the process of making the art it it temporarily fills the gap mm. Mm. but as soon as that piece is out of the way the gap it reappears you know mm. and uh, some people I think are just those with more extreme personalities get to the point where they completely reject that search mm. you know mm. um, and try and find solace in, and hopefully she found um comfort in whatever she was doing in, in, in Bournemouth, you know, hopefully she did find comfort in that. Well, she found comfort, I think, um, what I pick up, and she mentions it a lot in all the letters, on and off, reading the Bible, and I think I, in the bit I read, it's there too, that she was just really enjoying, but I get the feeling she's not reading the Bible as somebody who's necessarily a deeply religious believer in God so much as she's fascinated mm. by the construction of stories and language and I guess the Bible is probably quite a good read if you even just the kind of archaic nature of the writing itself mm. and the, the use of language I think would have absolutely I get the feeling from the letter she was absolutely fascinated by it so I think she found fulfillments in that aspect of religion but again I'm extrapolating what yeah I just thought of a, I'm going to completely misremember this quote, it's from the First World War and there was um, in the officer's mess a young officer from a very well-to-do family, they couldn't get him to behave or carry out his work, he was always getting drunk, so they gave him a copy of the Bible, trying to teach him a lesson and came back and he said it was the most wonderful and entertaining thing <laughs> he'd never read no, he'd never read so much bloodshed and, you know, because of the way the stories yeah. were constructed you know? yeah, and I absolutely. think it would appeal to people in that way as well yeah um, and of course she you know Rosemary hadn't properly disappeared she was in uh, she was getting out and doing things and Neil Astley talks about how she was a regular at Speaker's Corner mm. in London mm. um, Hyde Park in London which I find amazing because I, I spent Several months sketching people at um, Speaker's Corner between <laughs> two, for, yeah, around two thousand and five. So maybe she, maybe was she there. might have been there. I mean, um, but then you burn all the drawings. So we the don't drawings. Know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there you go. I mean, it is fascinating, isn't it? How, um, yeah, you um, that this sense of creative destruction for her, it was definitely a cleansing, wasn't it? But she obviously felt so destabilized. 
the kind of that I wonder also something that comes through in the poems Lizzie I don't know if you pick this up a sense of disgust or self-shame yeah, in a way very much. and I wonder I mean if this is something to ask on a podcast if that's something that one feels that makes you want to destroy things no. disgust at yourself your, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a kind of abjection mm-hmm. in a way it also depends on your subject matter if you're inclined to focus on the things that you dislike about yourself you know then that's only going to be heightened as well mm. but I mean not only the sense that you you're not your writing's not as good as it could be or should be you know um, the subject matter can eat away at you as well mm. Mm. Um, it's I don't know it's tough I write about really dark stuff you know and it's I have to push stuff aside because I would burn it but I don't know, it's hard, much harder now in sort of digital. Like you write stuff on your iPad or your phone and then print it out, and it exists in so many forms. You don't have a singular manuscript you can't anymore. Stick you know? a huge manuscript into the incinerator. You have to keep yeah, the yeah. computer out the window or something. Well, yeah, that, that's happened. <laughs> Maybe you just, one always needs somebody there with you to go, oh, I'll just take that yeah, yeah. before you burn it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's the mm. secret. But if you think about it so often, and again, you know, it does my head in because it's generally some male great male poet with some wife behind him who's probably writing poetry in a <laughs> cupboard somewhere mm. um they always were there to support and to it seems to be the 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 poets or writers who've lived to an old ripe old age with various anthologies coming up through that time that there has been someone there yeah. to just keep keep their feet on the ground my dad is that person for me I think he's hinted that he's secretly collecting all my poems together just in case I do something right dramatic too. quite right too. well I might just nab that one when oh, we go. oh this is for you anyway oh good um, good so I will have a copy yeah that's an interesting point about Rosemary isn't it that perhaps because of her age and being quite a strong independent woman that she didn't have the support network it's essentially that I, like you're saying a um, a, a man at that, uh, that point would mm. have had you know he would mm. have had perhaps this is hugely stereotypical but he yeah. probably would have had the wife at home like you yeah. said it's a, an emotional support whereas Rosemary had well uh, I think she, she had a husband often, yeah. you know, but, he was often you know, away yeah. I mean don't know enough about again you know there's various family conjecture a conjecture about their marriage I think he was quite supportive but whether he was supportive of her as a poet, I mean, I have to go back and ask my mum mm. about this, um, and my aunt, but or whether he was just supportive of her to have the role as wife or hostess, I just don't know. And I wonder if she's slightly, given he wasn't a poet himself or involved in that world, I wonder if she didn't have a slight double life mm. as well. I mean, she obviously she had Suarez where there would have been other poets and writers and artists there but it may well have been that some of the soirees were for her her husband's business friends yeah. you know what I mean mm. so so that probably could have com- her sense of herself being so fragile anyway that could have compounded it further perhaps and was there any pressure on you and your family um, to speak out about Rosemary when she was still alive and there were so many stories being well, told about her the pressure was well no one was much interest and she was as you saw in that letter categorical I meant business she <laughs> says that we all knew I used to mention her to friends like, uh, but then there was a sense the crazy Aunt Rosemary who was this amazing poet but she we had some of her books we had the bloater and um, so we and another children's book we've got at home my parents house but there really didn't have, we didn't have very much. Um, but as my mother would say, there wasn't an awful lot of interest in her as a poet, so much of her almost as a personality in the, in the family. Mm. Um, it wasn't in really until Niels just was absolutely dogged about getting in touch with my aunt and my mother and saying, how can I get hold of her? And it's because my mother heard that programme about her being lost. And then she got in touch with Neil and said, actually, <laughs> she's living in Bournemouth. <laughs> um, and so that's how a relationship began between Neil and my, my mother and my aunt Jill, who's executor. And in a way, I think both my mother and aunt were kind of trying, really trying to help Neil to try and tempt her out of her house. 
and you know, even talking to the neighbour of the house, can you slip this letter <laughs> under the door? No joke, you know. So it was really that which you know also heard that um, that program was I think very important for um, making people remember and be aware of her again. And so that was Neil obviously having long harboured a desire to find out what happened to her. I, yeah, I just I just wondered because I suppose people might start to think about, you know, if they were in your position or your, your mother's position mm. or aunt's, you know, it would be very easy to keep somebody secret. You know, if, it, if a relation said, I don't want to talk to anyone, you know, you can have my address and they'll go away. But most of us won't have you know radio 4 won't be making programs about <laughs> those people you know and you know because there were quite a lot of wild stories about what where she might be and mm, what she might mm, be up to mm. we couldn't say she was in bournemouth no i mean basically mum and jill told neil where she was but she was absolutely wanted to be left alone mm. so um mum knew that in a way rosemary would have been really furious well he, that was satan wasn't it? um <laughs> That so, in a sense, the reason that everybody kept it quiet was was um, partly because there wasn't much interest, so it was easy to do, but also because um, she really didn't want us to in her lifetime to 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 tell people where mm. she was. But you could see from that bit I read, you know, and I I as a young woman writing I sightly contact her about the anthology and that's the curtain that comes down. Mm. Very nicely but quite clearly. Um so you you knew you couldn't take it any further. You had to respect her wishes. Mm. But of course the when when she after she died, um we were able to celebrate her again. And in a and in a way that as I said before Lizzie, I know that she would be very, very pleased about that there are other of course as she said in a letter to me, she might worry about you, <laughs> um, but delighted to think that um, her work is inspirational for, for younger generations. Um, I think that's all we've got time for, and a really nice point to stop. Um, but before we go, we're going to have one final poem. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, no, just one more point I wanted to make, actually, was something from, again, from the Peter Orr uh, interview. Um, something she was saying which I think was was really nice um, about how important it is um, in in writing for you know to be living an interesting life so she said I think poetry was life's inspiration um, and she said in order to to have your own idiom I think she said um, you need to be a grown-up as well as being well read um, and then you can cure your reading with your life <laughs> um, and also she said that poetry she felt could almost be more powerful than life in the end if it works and it's done well but that's very really interesting isn't mm. it um, that she says that it could be more powerful but I think the thing is she felt the, the power was too strong for her in the end mm. didn't she yeah anyway <laughs> uh, this is Bedouin of the London Evening Ten years in your cafes and your bedrooms, great city, filled with wind and dust. Bedouin of the London evening, on the way to a restaurant my youth was lost, and like a medium who falls into a trance so deep she can be scratched to death by her familiar at its leisure, I have lain rotting in a dressing gown while being savaged horribly by wasted youth. I have been young too long, and in a dressing gown my private modern life has gone to waste. Thank you very much. Yep, yeah, and as I said, the free uh, recordings that we used uh, for research for the podcast today are all available at the British Library, and I'll put the reference numbers in the description for the podcast. The best thing that you can do if you want to know more about Rosemary Thompson at the moment is to go and buy the Bedouin of the London Evening, which is the collected poems of Rosemary Thompson available through Blood X Books. And there will be readings um, at the Ledbury Poetry Festival on the 11th of July. And will that be with Neil Astley? That's or, Neil Astley, yeah. and also, I'll also and be there Lucy talking be there a bit well. about And hopefully we will be as well. Oh, so, cool. <laughs> great. We'll have to see. But, um, thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Thank you. Um, pleasure. Wonderful. Absolute um, pleasure.